Hi, folks. Um, first off, thanks for having me. It's exciting to be here, and thanks to our hosts. Um, as was mentioned, my name is Daniel Coulson. I'm a co-founder of Reserve and Reserve's lead protocol designer. Um, so all of the hubbub that you've seen about different decentralized stablecoin protocols, that's been my life for the last year. Um, for those of you that don't know, Reserve is a stablecoin company focused on figuring out decentralized stablecoin tech. Um, we've been in the space for about a year. Um, you might know of us because we like to post very long descriptions of why other people's stable coins won't work online, um, despite not having published our white paper, but we are publishing our white paper next week, so. Um, <laughs> uh, right, so, in this talk, I'm not going to explain our protocol. Um, and that's because I've explained it 100 times in contexts like these, and it's not that interesting, and it's hard to actually understand in 10 minutes. So instead, I'm gonna share some of my thoughts about what's happening in the stablecoin industry, why that's happening, and where I think it should go. Um, so a little less than a year ago, three recent college grads with a roughly 15-page white paper raised about $133 million. Of course, this is baseless. And since then, there's been a gold rush into stablecoins. But I think the current industry looks different than you might have expected about a year ago, where um, you know, to maybe not be as uh, kind as I could be, we were promised algorithmic decentralized central banks. And instead, we've gotten 20 slightly better tethers. And so I think there's a, there's a question that I ask, which is sort of what happened and what's going to happen? Um, so in this talk, I'm going to talk a little bit about why we've ended up where we are right now, which I think is sort of a trough of disillusionment around decentralized stablecoins, um, where I think decentralization will play an important role in the, achieving the sort of ultimate value of stablecoins and crypto in general, um, and then some serious challenges that stand in the way of actually being able to achieve that. Um, so first off, there's a gold rush into stablecoins. Um, I think roughly starting around uh, November of last year and lasting through into June. Now there's a question of why did that happen? Um, so I think there are a few factors that went into this. So one was basis. Basis raised an insane amount of money right during sort of the, the, the peak of crypto hype. And lots and lots of people saw that and also saw that Tether was sort of shady and was probably needed to be replaced at some point. And so there was this sort of really clear and easily understandable opportunity. Where then, you know, have, talking to a lot of investors around that time, by basically February of last year, everyone was convinced that stable coins were super valuable and that, you know, whoever was going to win, um, that would be a great bet. And so lots of investors were looking to make bets um, and lots and lots of projects were popping up. You know, as of today, there's almost 100 stablecoin projects. Um, but I think since then, there's been um, a bunch of problems that have come up with decentralized stablecoins that have led to basically all of the activity and attention over the last few months being on fiat coins. Does anyone know why decentralized stablecoins haven't been more in the news? It's hard, yeah, it's really hard, <laughs> exactly. Um, lots and lots of people have published sort of speculative decentralized stablecoin designs and having read basically every single design in the space, um, basically all of them don't work. And I think the thing that happened over the last few months relative to the first six months of this year is people realized that. They basically realized wow, this is a lot harder than we thought. We kind of got into this because we thought it would be, you know, like, you know, like crypto is sort of a, a nice quick way to make money. Turned out to be this extraordinarily difficult mechanism design challenge. And then you see a lot of companies pivoting or releasing their own fiat coins or doing things like that. And now we have a bunch of new fiat coins. Notably better than Tether, <coughs> audited, et cetera. And there's a question. Are fiat coins enough? So is, is there actually a point to creating a decentralized stablecoin? Now, I think that fiat coins 
will be totally sufficient in a bunch of contexts. So for example, for traders within crypto doing ARP across exchanges, DF coins are fine. And for a bunch of applications like that. But I think the whole point of sort of a lot of the excitement around crypto is the way that it changes the fundamentals of trust. Where the institutions in our civilization are to a significant extent built upon the fundamentals of ways that you can trust and exchange with other people. I think a, a nice example of this is title insurance, where title insurance companies exist because facilitate because in order to make large transactions between people, you can't really have that be peer-to-peer -peer without something like blockchain tech. Where imagine that I want to buy your house and you want to sell me your house. And I bring this massive pile of cash to you and expect you to give me your house. Well, then we're in this weird situation where it wouldn't be that hard for you to just take my cash. And so because of that, we have title insurance companies that facilitate transactions like this. And I think this is a nice example of the way in which, the ways in which we can interact and trust one another sort of forms the institutions that end up being built in our society. Now, I think a, another good example of this is monetary institutions, where the thing that we trust monetary institutions to do is to manage currencies for us. Now, the way that we do that is basically we have these very powerful centralized institutions where we basically say, we trust you. Please do the right thing. Now, sometimes they do do the right thing. I think in the modern Western world, for the most part, they have done the right thing. You know, in the United States, for the most part, our monetary institution has worked well, at least relative to other institutions. However, there are many times when institutions like this fail. I think this points to the real purpose of decentralization in my mind, is basically that institutions like, like monetary authorities are one of the most important components of our economy, our society, our civilization in general. And when they fail, it sort of destroys the edifice on which everything is built. I think you can see that in Venezuela right now. Where it's worth paying attention to the fact that when a monetary institution fails, it's because the monetary institution is corrupted by the government. Where there's a, a sort of often repeated phrase in monetary economics that every monetary crisis is fiscal in nature. Which basically means the government needs to print money in order to finance its debts, fina uh, finance its you know, budget. It and so, great. thank you. <laughs> and so because of that, they turn to the printing press and basically make money in order, to, um, in order to pay for things. In the process, sort of defecting on the rest of society, defecting on the rest of the economy that they've built. Um, in 25 out of 29 cases of hyperinflation in the last 100 years, um, this is what has happened. So the thing that I think decentralized stablecoins are interesting for is that many things that monetary institutions do are relatively simple, especially when you're looking at pegged currencies. Where then, if you can create a decentralized currency that automates the process of many of the components of a central bank, I think this shows the way in which a change to the fundamentals of trust changes the institutions that you can build on top of that. More concretely, I think one of the incredibly exciting opportunities with blockchain tech is basically being able to replace relatively simple but critical civilizational institutions such that they won't fail in the ways that they historically have. And I think ideally you want to create institutions that are significantly more robust to corruption and failure than the ones that we've had so far. Now, like I mentioned at the talk, at the beginning of this talk, decentralized stablecoins are really hard, <laughs> which is why I haven't had more talk. And um, I think the creation of a stablecoin that is actually crypto money is a very difficult and very long-term challenge. This is what Reserve is trying to do. Um, a few, I think, major challenges that need to be overcome in order to actually do this. Um, so the first is decentralized governance. 
In all of crypto, decentralized governance is the giant elephant in the room that no one talks about. Again, the reason is because it's really damn hard. Most people talk about token voting systems. Token voting systems really don't work because they're easily corruptible by money. You need to create reputation systems, but reputation systems are also very difficult. Um, second is you need high quality collateral. In every stable coin system, you either need to over collateralize or have stable backing collateral. No, no uncollateralized stable coin system will work. And third, you need some way to actually get adoption. For Reserve, the thing that we're doing is following the standard practice from monetary economics um, for currency substitution, which is basically replacing the store of value function in highly inflationary countries. Um, we're going doing this in four countries, two of which we have partnerships in place to pursue this. A um, couple plugs on Reserve is uh, we'll be re releasing our white paper next week. We'll be publishing our decentralized governance white paper probably second month of 2019. Um, and if you're interested in uh, seeing our white paper, add me on Telegram at Daniel Coulson, and um, I'll add you to our pre-release list so I can send it to you in the next few days. Thank you so much, Daniel. Thank and you. Daniel, that's what you're doing today. I think Alex has one.